So last chapter we talked about electromagnetic waves. This chapter we talk about where those waves come from. Um, so electromagnetic radiation, this is what happens when you take charges and accelerate them. And we're going to see how to analyze that and how to do the math and what the results are. This first part, we're going to look at dipole radiation. But before we get into that, we need to examine something called retarded potentials. And uh, before you snicker, um, retarded has to do with time. So these are potentials that are slowed down because of the time it takes news to reach the point. So, um, so the thing that we have to, the big assumption we make is that when you're looking at a point in space, let me draw this out for you. So here's a point P. Um, the behavior of occurrence and charges around that point, so this is like uh, rho and j vectors around that point influence the potentials you see at that point. But really what you have to think about is how long does it take for the news to travel? So uh, news travels at the speed of light and the point can't possibly be affected by things that have occurred uh, too recently. And so really what the point has to do is look around it in increasingly larger and larger spheres, new color pink. So and so at this sphere it's worried about stuff that only occurred very very uh, co closely in the past. Whereas in this, this other sphere it, it looks a little further in the past and this sphere it looks even further in the past. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with um, some stuff that we learned in section 741. Um, the basic equations for how you calculate the E fields and B fields given potential. So the E field is simply minus the gradient of the V uh, minus the time derivative of the A field, the magnetic potential. And the B field is simply the curl of the A field. Okay, that, that's true no matter what uh, gauge you choose. Uh, we're going to use a Lorentz gauge because of its special properties. Um, the Coulomb gauge we're going to throw right out because it assumes that you know everything all at the same time, uh, which can't possibly be true. Um, so the, the Lorentz gauge sets um, the divergence of A field to be equal to minus 1 over C squared. You'll see that as mu naught epsilon naught. Remember we found out that that uh, mu naught epsilon naught is related to the speed of light uh, times the time derivative of the, of the potential, the electric potential. So that's the Lorentz gauge. And I missed a, an N there. Okay, so um, with the Lorentz gauge, we have the two equations for calculating the V and the A. We have the down Dalbertian of the V is equal to um, minus 1 over epsilon naught rho and the Dalbertian of the A vector is equal to uh, minus mu naught J vector where the Dalbertian is just the operator that takes the Laplacian and subtracts 1 over C squared times uh, the time the second time derivative of the acceleration of that field, okay? Um, if we didn't have any sources, if our rows and our j's were zero, then we just have straightforward wave equations. You know, we'd have the Laplacian of v equals the second time derivative of, of v. Um, if we had sources, we get, um, if we don't have sources, we get the homogeneous wave equation solutions. If we do have sources, we get inhomogeneous uh, wave equations. Uh, if we assume, for starters, that the time derivatives of the potentials in the, the R0, then we're just left with, um, so if we assume, so we assume those are zero, then we get the equations that you should recognize almost instantly and the Laplacian of the A vector is equal to minus u naught j. Um, and those have solutions um, that can be written out as v 
at r is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. There's our old friend. It's been a while since we've seen him, haven't we? Uh, over uh, r, curly r, dt, d tau, and the a vector at r vector. Now this is prime. Is equal to mu naught over 4 pi. Uh, checking my notes of j vector at r prime over curly r d tau where r prime let's draw this out so you can see what's going on here so we have stuff and we have a point p that we're interested in we have the origin and our vectors look like this we have the r vector points to the point the r prime vector points to the d tau that we're integrating and the curly r points uh, one way or the other and I feel bad now yes it points this way our, the curly r vector points that way and so this this isn't the r vector this is just the r distance um, it's just the distance between uh, r and r prime okay so uh, this is easy this is boring we don't get any interesting waves from this behavior because there's no time dependence whatsoever um, so we're going to move on beyond this and assume that the time derivatives are not zero. And what do we get then? Um, remember that we have to look back in time. We have to pull out our time machines and say, what was that point distant from the point we're evaluating at doing um, way back then? So let's introduce the concept of retarded time. So TR is going to be the current time at the point that we're interested in minus the distance to the point that we're integrating divided by the speed of light. So this is called the retarded retarded time. Um, as I'll show you in a, a second, well, I'm not going to do the math for this, but I'll you know flood my way through it and say that if you use t plus r over c, so the future, like the inverse retarded time, if you're traveling backwards in time, you're some kind of tachyon particle or something like that, then uh, it, the equations all work and everything's satisfied. But obviously, we're not going to do that because of causality. Um, which turns out to be an excuse for a lot of physics equations. So, um, hopefully this isn't complicated, um, but I will draw a picture one more time. So here's the point P, here's the origin, here's R vector, here's the d tau that we're evaluating, here's R prime, there's curly R. Okay, and so we're not interested at the j vector R prime at t, but instead t minus r over c, and the row at r prime, t minus r over c. So that's just you know the retarded current and the retarded um, uh, uh, charge density. All right, so that's what we're interested in at that point. Um, let's plug it into our equations. So we have v at r at time t, okay, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, integral of the charge density at this retarded time, so r vector prime, and then t r divided by curly r d tau, okay. So we're interested in the charge density as it existed a certain time ago at that point. And same thing for our a field, our a potential. Uh, I'm sorry, mu naught over 4 pi integral of j vector, um, the position at the, we're evaluating, the time that it used to be d tau. So there we go. Those are the two potentials that we're going to be using. Put these in a box and take them home. This is These are the important equations for this entire chapter. Okay. Now you might be asking, uh, first of all, does this work? And the answer is yes, yes it does. And, and I'm going to show you um, pretty much the rest of this video. I'm going to show you how the V satisfies the Lorentz gauge. It satisfies the potentials. I'm going to show you an example how you can calculate the magnetic and electric fields given these potentials. Um, the, the second question is why can't we just do this to the fields? Just you know, say what what is the field and, and look at the time passed for you know the the charge or the whatever the the current was and the answer is that doesn't work out um, if it should be somewhat obvious why that is because 
um, the fields depend on a lot more than just what the charge or the, the current is. It depends on what the charge or current was and how it's behaving and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's the potential is a lot simpler to calculate. Um, what about using the clone gauge? And as I said earlier, the clone gauge doesn't work because it assumes uh, you know everything all the time. So you can go back to chapter seven and review the clone gauge and the, the Lorentz gauge and look at those equations and, and figure out why that is. So uh, now I'm gonna show you why the, the potential V satisfies Lorentz gauge. And I'm gonna take a break in this video uh, for time's sake to help break this up. So uh, come back next, I'll show you how to satisfy V. Thanks for your time, bye.